Comic Book Savant Extra, Episode 9. Welcome back to the Comic Book Savant Extra Podcast. I'm your host, James Harris. This episode is going to be a, a spoiler review for The Incredibles 2. So if you haven't had a chance to go out and see the movie, you probably want to stop this podcast right now. Head over to the Comic Book Savant channel on YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash comic book savant. And I will have a non-spoiler review posted there. Um, if you haven't seen the movie and you're considering if you want to see the movie or not, if you're on the fence, I have a non-spoiler review there to give you my thoughts and my recommendation or not of the movie. So you probably want to go over to that, uh, go over to YouTube and check that review out over there. Um, for anyone else that has seen the movie or might not go out to see the movie and want to be a part of the spoiler discussions or want to hear more about the movie, then you're more free than uh, welcome to stick around and listen, but I just wanted to put that disclaimer and that, that warning up front before I get into the episode. Um, another thing I wanted to say with this episode, I want to dedicate, because I'm doing this the Monday after um, Father's Day, um, and I wanted to dedicate this episode to my father. I lost him seven years ago, uh, Memorial Day weekend, so it's just... This anniversary of his passing was just uh, not too long ago. So it was kind of crazy with this movie coming out on Father's Day. And going to see it on Father's Day, um, it, had, it, it heightened the emotion with some of the content that was in the movie, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. But I just wanted to um, put that out there up front. <laughs> um, I have to say, like, you know, it's been 14 whole years since we had The Incredibles. And we've been clamoring for you know, for a sequel to this movie. It was so much, it was so funny that when the movie started, they even put a little PSA or little video out saying, you know, sorry, it's taken so long. Thank you for your patience. We know it's been, you know, 14 years. I don't know how it kind of played to the crowd. I kind of, you know, it was like, you know, it takes a long time to do a film like this. And they, like, try to break down the process. I think everyone's kind of savvy. People, at least, you know, anyone that is 18 years or older at this point is pretty transparent now how long it takes to kind of get a animated film off the ground. They kind of, you know, try to, it, it didn't take 14 years. We've seen sequels to, you know, a ton of other Pixar movies. Let's look at the, over the 14 years, how many toy stories we've had. Shoot, we've had three whole car movies in 14 years. So, you know, it was kind of, I, I don't know how it kind of played, but I, I could have kind of did without it. We understand it takes a while. I mean, I've read a ton of interviews about Brad Bird just, you know, not believing in sequels too much. And he said, and whenever he did it, he wanted to take his time with it and he wanted to have the right story to tell. So with that being said, was this a worth the wait? I feel like it was for sure. Definitely, um, worth the, the wait in, you know, and I, I'll say this right off the, 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 the top that I hopefully, I feel like in the, as the movie played out, that it, we need a, a Incredibles three. I hope it doesn't take fourteen years. You know, I'm looking. At, I'm feeling that. You know, barring nothing happens to um, to the older actors that are related with the franchise, that they could do a movie within the next six years. Because since it was the fourteenth anniversary, if they do the third one, you know, that the summer that would be the twentieth anniversary. That would kind of be cool, and do one more to kind of close it out. I know Brad Bird at the premiere even came out and said, you know, that, um, he wanted to do more movies. He didn't want to be a director that, you know, banked on sequels. Um, but I just hope so he doesn't have to hear for the next 14 years as he does other projects. When you're going to do Incredibles three, when you're going to do Incredibles three, that they kind of 
go ahead and get on top of it because how he, I felt like how this movie set up and how it ended, it felt like a second movie and it was more story to tell and it's more story to kind of come. And I feel like if they can kind of put a cap on it, kind of like they did with cars, they did, you know, like a trilogy, it would just seem off if they didn't have three movies because toy story has had what four, you know, movies, um, or is going to have four movies. We've had, um, you know, um, Cars has had three movies, you know, so they've kind of done it and it just sets up. This definitely feels like the middle of a trilogy to me. I just had that feeling. And that was the one emotion I came away with most when it ended was that it needs to be one more movie to, to cap this all off. And then like, I think I'll be satisfied is that if they put a de- kind of definitive cap and it feels like an end, cause this didn't feel like an end. So I kind of felt like if he didn't want to do a sequel, he shouldn't have ended the movie the way he did. <clears throat> but with that being said, let's, let's get into the technical side of the, the movie. Incredibles two directed by Brad bird, which he directed the first movie. He also wrote the first movie. He wrote this movie as well. Um, the breakdown is, um, Bob Parr, AKA Mr. Incredible is left to take care of Jack, Jack, why Helen and, uh, Helen slash Elastic girl is out saving the world. We have pretty much all the main cast returning from the first movie. We have Craig T Nelson back as Bob Parr, AKA Mr. Incredible. We have Holly Hunter back as Helen Parr slash Elastic girl. Um, we have Samuel L. Jackson back as Lucius best, AKA Frozone. Uh, we have Sarah, uh, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Vowell back as Violet. We have Huck Milner back as Dash. We have Eli Fuchel as Jack Jack Parr. We have Brad Bird reprising his role as Edna Mode. Jonathan Banks uh, as Rick uh, Dickner, or Dicker, I think it's Dicker, not Dickner. Uh, Catherine Keener as Evelyn uh, Devar, Devor, I think it's Devor is how they pronounced it. Um, Bob, um, Odenkirk as Winston DeVore, uh, Isabella Rossellini as the ambassador and John Ratzenberger, which is in all the Pixar movies as the underminer. Um, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of the movie, this movie had a lot of heart. It was a lot of fun. It was very colorful. You could definitely see immediately that the technical technological advancements that have come along in the 14 years, and it still kept the same visual style that we're used to from the first Incredibles, but they were able to do so much more, and the scenes were so much more dynamic um, throughout the movie that it really, um, it really um, shined, shunned through throughout the film from beginning to end. I feel like this movie was definitely more faster paced than the original movie. Um, and they were able, like I said, um, this is a positive and a negative. It was a lot more action in the movie, but a lot of the action that did take place in the movie, except for a few standout scenes, um, which one is the fight between Jack Jack and the raccoon and the one between Helen and uh, the screen slaver in the apartment. Those were two super duper standout scenes. The other main action pieces like Helen um, stopping the runaway train. We had a similar scene with Mr. Incredible in the first movie, kind of stopping a monorail train. Um, and you know, a lot of the animations that they saw that was really a whole bunch of cool things that we saw her do on her bike with separating the bike and her body stretching and doing a lot of cool things that was different, but like, um, her attaching to the train, making a parachute and all that. We, we saw those similar animations in the first movie, like when she went to the, to the Island, um, things like that. So some of the animation beats that were similar, they just were pasted on a new kind of thing. Um, it didn't hit me while I was watching the movie cause I just enjoyed the movie as I watched it. But when I was sitting back, when I came home, you know, and I, and I start trying to do the write up for these reviews, you know, I start going over beats and I was like, kind of beat for beat. The stories between Incredibles one and two are very similar. Um, as far as action beats and action set pieces that took place, but you just kind of, you switch roles instead of it being, um, Mr. Incredible out in the field, we got a last girl. So she was able to get the spotlight, which, you know, um, is just negative in the way that 
it read once you sit and think about it it reads familiar um but it didn't make it any less enjoyable and it was very inventive in in its uh presentation but it was like hmm we had a runaway train scene before huh we kind of had um airplane sequence before Hmm, we got another one here um we had a boat sequence here it's like okay it's a cross between you know um you know you know it just read as familiar it wasn't as distinct enough as i wanted to wanted it to be thinking back in the movie like i said when you're enjoying the movie in the moment it was it was fine but that was you know of a movie i think very highly of i think this is one kind of red mark against it that it would it read as familiar in some parts in the in the story itself just it was a switching places type thing um i feel like jack jack by far was the mvp of this movie he was such an integral character and they grew him out so fantastically and you know just on the strength of his character alone i want to see a third movie to see him a little bit more age see how much further his powers develop you know, they, they planted certain seeds there that when super babies are born, they have the ability to have multiple powers. But then as they, they grow older, it focuses down into one. But he has access to so many powers. It's something that, like, even Edna herself had never seen before. And I want that to be played upon in a, in a third movie on, you know, as he gets a little bit older, maybe five or six years old or something like that, that, you know, does he still have like 17 powers or does he have like five or four or three? And then how rare is that? And does that put him under fire, under scrutiny that, that people might want to come after him because of that, because he's so unique, that would be something interesting to explore. Um, I, th- I felt like out of all the characters, and it was it was a lot of characters in this in this movie that you, you care about. You know, you've had a whole other movie to get you know to be introduced to to all these characters, the Parr family, Frozone, and so forth. To to see these characters, you know, further, I felt like the one character that kind of had the least amount to do and was the most underdeveloped was Dash, which I love Dash from the first movie. Um, the, he was very much the little brother, the annoying little brother in this movie, which was, which, which was cool, but I would have liked that he had some, you know, semblance of, uh, more of a storyline to build upon his character going forward. I think they did a really good job with, with, um, Bob and with Helen and even with Lucius, um, even Edna, it was surprising to see how Edna took to Jack Jack and now she's like auntie auntie Ed, eddie or whatever she said um in her rapport with jack jack though i mean she was and was only like in two scenes but they were like two of the funniest scenes in, in the movie um especially when you know um, bob comes to pick jack jack up and they're both walking down and and you know jack jack is walking like edna and it was just hilarious um, and I love that. And I want to see more of that, that, you know, you know, Edna's so hard, but to see her to crack to Jack, Jack, and that she just fell in love with him immediately, um, was fantastic. Um, what else I can say? Um, I really thought Bob Odenkirk and Catherine Keener did a fabulous job as additions to the, to the film. Um, you know, some people have already complained about does the, um, does Incredibles two have a villain problem? I, was it, you know, uh, I was watching another review, a non-spoiler review on YouTube and someone said something and I totally agreed with them on this point is that, you know, as a 42 year old man, I am not the demographic for this film. Um, I, yes, as nostalgic because it came out 14 years ago and I saw the movie and I love the movie and, um, you know, I've been waiting for the sequel for a long time, but I'm not the target demographic. They make these movies for little kids. Was it me? Was it evident from the first time that, um, Evelyn Keener's character came on the screen that she was going to have something to do with being the villain in the movie? Yes. I knew that immediately once I saw her and they entered, they talked about their position about how their family died. Did I, what did I know she had something to do with being the villain? Yes, I did. Um, the reveal was still kind of cool because they tried to put some kind of red herrings here and there to kind of throw you off. But I knew, yeah, she's the villain 
or she's related, she's tied into the villain in some shape, form, or fashion. I kind of thought maybe the brother and sister were working together because kind of how they portrayed certain things, but in the end, it was just her operating on her own, which was cool because it might, it probably would have been obvious too if uh, Bob Odenkirk, if you've ever watched Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, which are two shows that I love. Um, you know, if he had something to do with the villainous side, it would have just been such a dead giveaway because if you've seen him in live action television uh, things, that he's played one of those kind of great characters. So it was cool to see that he was through and through like a good guy and it was his sister that had the dark side or harbored those those bad feelings um, towards supers. I thought her motivation was, was on point and it tied into events that happened in the previous movies, and which I thought was really good that you saw it was real consequences in the world from what the government did by um, causing supers to go away and have to be underground and operate in secrecy, that it was repercussions. And one of the repercussions is one of the, you know, main backers for the ac- advocacy of superheroes died by the hand of robbers where his superhero friends were kind of, you know, hands tied to go out to protect one of the biggest people that supported them, you know, on a political side and just in public in general, that was a really neat hook to the movie, um, itself, um, for sure. Um, You know, I, I love the world building. I love the introduction of this whole next generation of, of supers. I want to see it explored more and to see that, you know, that, you know, since the Incredibles have came back on the, on the scene as, as a family, we saw a little clip at the end where the, the Void character was talking to Violet. It was so impressed by how she operated in the situation and, and Dash and how the kids now are, are kind of in the spotlight because they've signed a accord to bring supers back. So they're now fighting crime legally as a family. And what are going to be some of the repercussions of that? We know that, um, far as we know how the movie ends, Evelyn is still, I mean, she's arrested for her crimes, but we, she's rich, you know, and even Violet says it, if we know because she's rich, she's going to get out and probably get only get away with a slap on the wrist as she's being arrested. And Helen is talking to her, you know, she's still unremorseful. I thought one of the darker parts of the movie was that, you know, Evelyn was dead set on dying when she, um, got knocked out of the plane to the point where she was fighting Elastigirl while Elastigirl was trying to save her life. Like she wanted to die and like, she wanted her to, you know, have feel some responsibility to the point. She fought her tooth and nail from, for her trying to save her life. And she said, it didn't change anything with you saving my life. So she still has a disdain towards supers and, you know, with that being said, like she still has a grudge. So she's still dangerous. She's still on the board, uh, for sure. So, um, that's going to be interesting going forward. Like if, or when they do, uh, Incredibles three that, you know, she could be a threat, you know, most definitely how, and how's that going to play out? And is even her brother, you know, going to be safe from her considering, you know, he allowed her to get arrested. He didn't come to her aid. You know, he felt different. He, like his father were very much supportive of supers. And that was what he believed in to the point that he, um, came up with all this to get superheroes back reenacted, you know, as, um, as, you know, being a legal thing. So, he might even be in danger. So it's a lot of meaty bits that are left that can be explored in one more movie. Like I said, that can be a culmination. I would also say this. I would like to see in the sequel that it's a time jump where the movie is more focused on the kids. We've had two movies. One movie was you know, focused on the father. One was focused on the mother. Let it go to the kids and we see them a little bit older and see how some years into the superhero game, how it has affected their lives for the better or maybe even the worse and kind of see the parents more kind of being transitioned out on the side. Uh, maybe they're the heads of an agency that trains the, the newer generations of, you know, superheroes or um, a government agency tied into the, the supers or something, because, you know, most of their generation from the first movie, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me, were wiped out by um, my buddy. Um, what's his name? I lost. I forgot his name. 
what was the villain's name? Um, whatever the villain's name was in the first movie. I totally just blanked out on that. Um, oh, man. I'm going to look it up because I hate when I do that. And I have it, like, right on the... Right in my head, but I cannot uh, remember. Syndrome. Okay, Syndrome. Um, Syndrome wiped a lot of them out. They're not... They're dead, you know? So, they're really... Frozone, Helen, and, and Bob are, are that, that, that last of the original kind of generation. So, it would, get to, it would be good to see we saw... The ending, you know, the law where they had to go on the ground and them kind of coming out, them getting the law passed and them being out front. But then now, because this movie picking up right after the first movie, which I thought was kind of cool. I necessarily wouldn't have done it, but it was cool still seeing it. And you had to reintroduce people because it had been so long. So so it, with it picking up right after the first movie, you can kind of go back and watch the first. And when this comes out on home video, you can watch them. It's really like it feels like one whole film that just happens to be three, almost four hours or whatever. And instead of, you know, it's a, a big separate, you know, a big disconnect between the two because it literally picks up with that fight scene that the, ends the movie with the underminer coming up out of the ground. So, um, I did like that, but I would like to see a time jump now and see the kids more established. Maybe, you know, Violet, you know, um, just graduating college, I'm just graduating high school, going into college dash on his way, graduating, you know, getting ready to graduate high school, Jack, Jack, you know, like in middle school or whatever, you know, the parents at this point are pretty much like transitioning, have transitioned out of the superhero game, you know, or right. Or maybe they're struggling with letting go and still holding on, but they've kind of did those beats in the first two movies already with them. So I would really like to see the focus shifted away from them and more towards the kids for sure. Um, and, and Jack, Jack, especially to see, uh, you know, especially we saw that Edna definitely had some influence over him and his family and him developing his own more personality and have him, you know, be able to talk more, you know, cause I think that would just be hilarious to see what kind of character he has developed into. They have me so curious on that based on how they they did certain scenes with Jack, Jack and I, one of the best fight scenes I've seen this year in any movie live action or animated is Jack Jack versus the raccoon. I could just buy that. I will just buy this movie on home video just to watch that scene over and over again. It was hilarious. Um, overall, you know, you guys, I break down the movie and I give it a rating out of 10. I gave this movie an 8.5 out of 10. I really love the movie. Um, I judge it on five different categories. I got acting. I gave it a nine out of 10. The casting, I gave it a 10 out of 10. The direction, I gave an eight out of 10. The special effects, I gave a nine out of 10. And the story, I gave a seven out of 10. And the reason why I gave the story um, a seven out of 10, since that was the lowest category I gave or rating I gave out of the five different categories was just based on the point of what I stated earlier in the review that certain beats, story beats felt just similar. It was like the same story, but flipped. And it's the second time in as in many weeks as I've, um, I've experienced that in a movie. I, you know, I watched, um, oceans eight. I saw that a week or so ago. I think it came out last week and I watched that. Um, and it was a thing where it definitely felt like it was, it was a, a repeat of the first o- oceans 11, but it was with a female cast, but you know, certain shots, certain, everything were beat for beat was from the oceans 11 movie, but it was a switch. Did it inhibit my enjoyment of the movie? No, but it was noticeable and it lingered in my mind. Like I've seen this feels familiar. So that was the one, I think downside to, um, the movie for me, but all in all, I can't wait to get this on home video. I think this was very pleasant. You know, um, if I didn't have so many other movies to go see and review for you guys, I would love to go see this again at the theater. Um, but I can't because what a couple of weeks we got Ant-Man versus the Wasp. I got reviews coming for you guys on between the main channel and the YouTube channel. Um, uh, Supergirl season finale is coming up. So I'll have a review up of that. Um, Luke Cage season two is coming out this weekend. So I'll have a review for that coming up. 
Um, Voltron, the legendary defender season six just got released. I have to record that sometime this week so I can get that review up and out. So it's so much stuff. So I can't, I don't have time to rewatch movies cause I still have more stuff to check out and review and more comics to read. Um, but it'll be out on home video soon enough. Probably, I don't know, maybe September, October at the latest. Um, uh, Disney has been doing a really good job in, in, in putting out the movies. Like I just saw that, Infinity War is coming out with August 14th, I want to say. Yeah, I think it's August, August 14th for um, home video, which is going to be awesome because I'm ready to see that again. Um, so this one will be out, like I said, September, October at the very latest. You know, uh, it made a killing this weekend. Since I'm doing this on Monday, the box office returns kind of came in. I think it said it grossed $180 million domestically, which is really good. I think this movie's going to hit a billion for sure. I mean, and this has rewatchability. Like I, you know, like if I had the time, I would, would definitely go see this movie again at the theater. And it was crazy because I didn't have the best experience. And actually this is kind of a preview of what the next episode, um, episode, I think 384 that's going to be dropping later this week is going to actually talk about movie going experiences and how it affects us as comic fans since it's so many comic book related movies. So that's just a preview. And I'm going to talk about this experience and just the experience in general. And I talked to some of you guys via the Facebook group and some replies I got on Twitter as well a while back about this. I've been brewing this one for a while and I'm going to be talking about that in some more detail. Um, but that's all I have for you for this episode. Like I said, I give this an 8.5 out of 10, very strong movie, really good time, um, at the theater worth seeing if you haven't. And if you listen to this, I just spoiled a lot for you, but it's still worth going to see anyway for yourself. Um, again, don't, don't be afraid to leave comments and let me know what you thought of the movie, what you rated the movie as. I like getting feedback from you guys on what your thoughts are on the, the things that I review and talk about as well. I also want to give a shout out to you guys just for all the support. I've been having a lot of growth with not just the audio podcast, but with the YouTube channel, it's been exploding lately. Um, it was slow going for a while and I was kind of like, man, is this ever going to catch on? It's been growing. Um, you guys have been flooding the Facebook, you know, Facebook page, liking the page, um, liking links and stuff that I've posted on there, helping me continue to grow this out. Like I said, this was a, a year of transition for me and I was at a crossroads, um, when, when I did the anniversary show back in August and it's, you know, it's, it's amazing that it's almost been, we're almost at August again. And, you know, we will be launching into year 13. It's like 12 years into this, you know, it's, it's continuing to grow and, and take on its own kind of shape. I've been trying my best to, um, evolve the content that I'm, that I'm uh, giving you guys and making it a little bit more diverse, but still always about comic books in the comic book industry. And it seemed like you guys have really taken to it, which has really inspired me and allowed me to do as much content as I've been doing between the two channels. And you guys have just been eating it up. So I appreciate all the love you guys have been showing me. Um, not just the, for the comic books of my brand, because it's, it's not just a podcast anymore. It's not just a YouTube channel. It's a brand that's across multiple platforms. And I want to keep doing that and keep doing more. Um, I have a lot of plans. I got a lot of stuff in the works. And also coming up in August, it's going to be a lot going into the celebration of um, year 13 of comic book savant It's going to be crazy giveaways. So make sure you only don't just subscribe to the podcast. We'll be doing giveaways on multiple fronts. We're going to be giving away books through the podcast, through Twitter, through um, Instagram, as well as the YouTube channel. So I got a lot of stuff coming. I got a lot of stuff that I want to talk to you guys about new uh new friends that i'm making in the uh, in the industry new sponsors that are coming on that means more stuff i can give away still with old sponsors it's going to be a lot of good stuff coming up i've been working hard behind the scenes with a lot of people to bring a lot of stuff coming up so just be on the lookout i hope you guys are excited as i am with the stuff that's to come on the channel or on the brand, because like I said, it's it's not just the podcast anymore. It's the YouTube channel uh, as well. So definitely be on the lookout. That's all I have for you guys for this episode. 
I'll see you later this week for another episode of Comic Book Savant. You guys take care, and I will see you soon. Bye.